but she started her PhD in the Free University of Berlin and did a postdoc also in Berlin at the Hustler Lab in immune dynamics, studying immune uh, immune responses, multiplexing uh, using different uh, technologies that use multiplexing uh, techniques. And then uh, in 2022, she received the Ramonica Hall, which is a group leader position, and she joined the CINAC. And she's now very much interested in understanding tissue architecture uh, using special uh, special techniques, uh, special transcriptomics. I think this is what you were going to talk about. So yeah. that's why we invited her. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing her. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Marta and Nuria, for the invitation and for hosting me. I uh, That's my first time here, so I'm quite happy. Um, Yes, and actually um, today I'm just going to give you a brief overview on what is spatial transcriptomics, um, which techniques are, let's say, within this uh, broad term. And um, I'll also show you some applications or some thoughts and data on how we are applying these techniques to uh, study tissue heterogeneity and, and disease emergence and progression. Uh, but first of all, oops, sorry, it's not now, exactly. So uh, first of all, I'll, I'll um, present and thank also uh, the, the two teams that were involved in all the data that, we'll, that I will show you uh, today. So first of all, uh, my team back in Berlin. So I moved uh, here in Barcelona um, some months ago, so it's... Um, Everything quite new also for me. So it all started in Berlin uh, with uh, my colleagues, especially Sandy and uh, Ralph and my mentor, Anja Hauser. They were the ones who teach me how to actually understand spatial tissue biology and immunology. Mm -hmm. And um, also now uh, the team here at the CNAC, at the single cell genomics team led by Holger and um, where I'm basically coordinating and, and leading the spatial applications. Um, and I want to emphasize the work of uh, Sara and Patri, who are the people actually hands on the tissues. And um, without their fine work, um, you couldn't actually extract data from human archival tissue samples. RNA integrity is crucial. So their work is uh, very important. And then the work of uh, Helena, who is a very talented and creative postdoc, all the nice uh, plots and visualizations that you will see during this talk uh, have been actually created by her. So it's basically her magic um, and Holger, who's the one that recruited me and brought me from Berlin back to Barcelona, where, where I'm actually now very happy. Um, so since I'll be speaking for 40 or 45 minutes about um, spatial transcriptomics, uh, let me first discuss on why do we need to look at the spatial dimension, right? And it's basically because uh, the spatial of organization of every uh, biological structure actually determines their function. So from the um, precise location of molecules within cells to the uh, localization of cells within tissues, or the microanatomical arrangement of tissue niches, um, which are composed of several interdependent cells, and also the um, um, arrangement of the different organs within an individual, the distribution of individuals around the globe. So all of these different scales are governed by spatial fingerprints, and only understanding the spatial uh, dimension of these scales from molecular bio biology to epidemiology, can we really understand uh, health and disease? So, but that's actually uh, not a new concept, uh, why spatial um, is important. Actually, that's why histopathology is still one of the gold standards to diagnose human disease. But classical histopathology uh, pathology techniques such as uh, hematoxylin and neosin um, or immunofluorescence, histochemistry, all of them uh, are actually very low plex. So we can detect one or up to four or five different features from tissues with these classical techniques. And that actually limits quite, limits quite a lot what we can extract, the data that we can extract from, from these samples, right? But the last 10 years, there has been 
um, a lot of developments on the genomics field mainly that have made possible that we can actually detect uh, or read the whole genome or the whole transcriptome of any single cell in a given tissue. We still then were missing the spatial dimension. And when we look at these very basic images from two different tissues, age and, e and immunofluorescence, we actually see that there are, spa uh, that are cells that are forming very particular structures, in this case, epithelial structures or endothelial structures. And there are some cells that are hanging around close together in one very particular area of the tissue and not on the other area of the tissue. So we need to understand how this, um, how the transcriptional um, information is actually um, organized in the space within the tissue to understand how these cells are interacting and how their localization can impact um, um, tissue disease. So, um, and since tissues are very complex and they are composed of very different cell types, very different cell states that actually talk to each other via direct contacts or via parkrine signaling, um, we need this high um, complexity to have this broad overview on what's going on in our tissue. Um, and that's the, this pressing need is what has uh, actually pushed for um, the emergence of spatial um, tissue profiling techniques. Um, and in general, spatial tissue profiling techniques actually um, um, emerged already 10 years ago, more or less. Um, and the first ones were actually antibody-based cycling techniques. So they were meant to detect proteins. Um, and <coughs> to four years, there was um, a huge development and maturation of uh, the techniques that were meant to detect transcripts, so RNA molecules in tissues, spatial transcriptomics techniques. And on the detection of DNA, that's where we are probably expecting in the near future quite a lot of, um, um, of work going on. So there's a lot of uh, different techniques that oh, have yeah, been yeah. Um, emerging and being developed during the last years. Actually, there are more than 50. And all of these 50 um, spatial tissue profiling techniques uh, actually were developed within research labs. But now, right now, more than 10 of those are already being commercialized. So that's already, let's say, um, uh, a hint of how uh, how much interest those techniques are are generating in the biomedical community, basically. Um, but uh, all these different techniques that are basically detecting or protein or uh, transcripts actually differ a lot in the resolution. <laughs> Hello. Yes. <laughs> in the resolution uh, that they actually allow us um, um, uh, to detect in the spatial dimension, but also in the plexity um, that, we, that we are able to obtain from them. And uh, also, therefore, on the biological breadth that we can, that we can read. And that is very important uh, to really then understand which are, or which is the best technique to actually answer a particular biological question. So they are really complementary um, and, and, and not, um, let's say, um, very um, similarly applicable. But now, if we go focus really on spatial transcriptomics technique, and we agree that, let's say, the aim would be um, to profile the transcriptome of any single cell in a tissue, retaining the tissue architecture, we have to, uh, let's say, separate uh, two main types of spatial transcriptomics techniques. So on the one hand, we have the uh, capture base uh, techniques um, that allow us to read the whole transcriptome of a, a given tissue. Um, we first expose the RNA from these tissue sections. This RNA will then be captured onto the designated slides that have some oligos. They are coated with oligos. Then 
we will then, uh, uh, let's say, move into or transform the RNA into cDNA and prepare the library that will then be sequenced in normal uh, uh, sequencers, right? What we get from this um, is nevertheless not true single cell measurements, but rather mini bulk measurements that we can then deconvolute in order to obtain the single cell resolution that we were actually looking for. On the other hand, we have the imaging-based uh, spatial transcriptomics techniques, which are basically microscopes with microfluidic systems, right? Um, in there, uh, what we do is to actually hybridize the probes on the tissue. The tissue stays on the slide. Um, and what we read from here is fluorescent signal with the microscope. So in here, actually, we have subcellular resolution, normally single molecule resolution. And we have to assign each of these molecules or transcripts to a single cell. And to do that, we need a pre-step, computational step of uh, cell segmentation. So we have molecules, we have the cells, and then we can, we can do the assignments, let's say. Um, at the CNAC, uh, we are working with both types of spatial, of spatial transcriptomics techniques. Um, on the capture-based side, we are working uh, with Visium, uh, and we are establishing now also Visium HD and StereoSeq. And on the um, uh, microscope or imaging-based side, uh, we have Cosmics and uh, Cinium. But uh, today I'll mainly, I'll mainly, I'll just show you one slide on, on Visium data um, and how you can very easily, let's say, combine Visium with other uh, spatial tissue profiling techniques. But that will just be one slide and then I'll spend the rest of my talk showing uh, post cosmic data. All right, um, so as I just mentioned, uh, right, um, the Visium technique um, is very flexible in the way that uh, you can uh, perform um, multimodal analysis on the same tissue section or in um, adjacent tissue sections. So you get your, you have your tissue, you can staining, stain it with either uh, HNE or immunofluorescence to have this uh, broad idea of tissue regions, tissue areas, um, that a pathologist can then annotate, right? And on the same slice of tissue, you can then perform a visium, which is actually whole transcriptome. And it allows you to really profile um, um, uh, all transcripts on top of that tissue. And although you do not have single cell resolution, um, you can, let's say, distinguish different tissue uh, unique tissue microenvironments or niches that are distinct one uh, to the other and that might change uh, um, upon disease. And on top of that, you can also then leverage the fact that you can uh, stain these, uh, these tissue sections with um, high plex immunofluorescence and thus on the same areas on those niches that you have already um, uh, deeply characterized at the transcriptional level, go deeper into the cell typing at the protein level, characterizing which cells are in there and which molecules interact uh, with, each, uh, with each other. Um, and now I'll really uh, focus on cosmic. So we, uh, we, we are moving from this more um, microanatomical tissue view and we now get into the single molecule um, uh, analysis. Um, so in cosmics, uh, in the instrument itself, what it happens, it's uh, 16 cycles um, of flashing fluorescently labeled um, um, barcodes, let's say. Um, and in each of these 16 cycles, you actually flash four different fluorophores. So you have a 64-bit coding system that it's then what will allow us after uh, the run is finished to actually decode and, and, and detect 1,000 uh, different transcripts. Um, and that's actually very powerful. So that's the commercially available uh, solution that Cosmics offers right now. And um, the, the data that we get out of, of, uh, of, of one given tissue, let's say, is first of all, an image um, 
at the protein levels so with immunofluorescent stainings, four or five different markers that allow you to have this broad view on the uh, tissue composition. Um, but you also get on top of that, these 1K um, transcripts, single molecules that you detect um, uh, in the tissue. Based on the proteins that you, the protein information that you have, which uh, um, span, expands both the nuclei and the membrane of any given cell in your tissue, you can then, and this is not something that you do manually, but computationally based on machine learning approaches, let's say computationally identify cell boundaries, computationally ident identify single cells and match these transcripts to each cell. And once you have this uh, um, linked information, all these 1,000 uh, different transcripts belong to these different cells. You can actually classify the cells uh, in the tissue, perform cluster an clustering analysis, and label the different cells. And of course, then move forward and do some more uh, downstream analysis. But that's a, a, a big overview of the data that we get out of, out of um, uh, these techniques. And uh, since at the CINAC, we actually got the first uh, cosmic instrument worldwide. So there was not much known about how you had to deal with this data, uh, standards on how to process um, um, these data. We decided to start with a tissue that is very well characterized, very well characterized transcriptionally, but also anatomically, let's say, or, or microanatomically. So it's a tissue that, it's, um, that it has an epithelial layer that you can see here in yellow and cyan, and that it has follicles, these bubbles that you see here um, in magenta, and the interfollicular uh, regions. So it's a very well studied tissue. And it was a perfect case study for us to then develop a, a pipeline, an analysis pipeline, um, and to see how deep uh, or how far could we go with this technique. So again, um, I've already explained a bit the data that we get out of here, but just for you to have an idea, right? So um, the imaging system actually um, doesn't scan. It's not a proper scan, but it's uh, individual um, um, capture areas that we have, these fields of view, these are these small squares that you see, and um, of any given tissue, you can actually acquire hundreds of those. This is an example where we had 93 fields of view and an idea of the number of cells that we get out of, out, out of this tissue, it's almost 400,000. So it's really a lot of data. One K-plex panel for all of them. Um, and now this brings me already to the first step uh, of the uh, computational analysis pipeline that is the quality control, right? So there's uh, nothing known about how do we need to control for quality in these types of data, especially in the imaging-based spatial transcriptomics techniques. Um, and um, we observed from the very beginning is actually, um, and you can see that in this immunofluorescence image, that there are these, um, uh, you can see these squares, you can see these borders, right, in every single field of view. Um, well, what we can see visually at the protein level, let's say, uh, it's also easy to be seen at the transcriptional level in terms of of transcripts sí. obtained. Oh, eso la tenemos. So eso, sí, sí, la plots, tenemos que evitar, see, eh. The x axis Hombre, we have claro. To y que, y que, sí, hombre, claro, so vamos los dos, qué bien. Sí, sí. Y me right lleva right genial con ella. Every single field of view. Sí, era majísima. And the y axis we have the total sí, RNA. Sí, ella yo me llevaba muy bien. So sí, mira, ella venía a veces a verme a karate. <laughs> y luego estábamos juntos ahí después de karate. Oye, guys, I think that there's someone... Vivíamos los dos, vivíamos al lado, el uno del otro. Mucho sabe.
There we go. No? Yes, this will this will be again uh, challenging. We'll leave it like this. It's okay, no? Vale. All right. No, all good. <laughs> so again, so we saw that in these borders, right? We had this um, 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 faulty segmentation um, uh, uh, problems, um, half cells being detected where we had way less counts than uh, in the rest of the field of view. So what we did is we decided to just drop off the cells that were containing few counts. Um, we also um, dropped off the, all those cells uh, that had very few counts, not only because of these border effects, uh, but also because um, 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 they were um, not deeply profiled, let's say. And this um, led us to uh, actually lose around 5% of cells in this given tissue, but that's actually the uh, more or less uh, the average uh, uh, of this uh, filtering um, step. So um, we retain a lot of cells that, um, um, that are high, qu high quality cells and that we now can actually sort of um, um, profile, cluster and annotate. Uh, so what we used to, um, to do that is the in-situ type algorithm. That's an algorithm developed by Nanostring, so the um, uh, company behind um, Cosmics, which is actually an, algor an algorithm tailored for uh, Cosmics data. It not only uses the count matrix, but also the information on the, at the protein level, the size and the shape of the cell, so the, the area of the cells um, and the background signal. And um, what we decided to um, use was uh, this algorithm in a semi-supervised mode. So you can fit this algorithm with a single cell reference. And since uh, Ramon from Holger's group just uh, published the Tonsil Human Cell Atlas, uh, that's what we leveraged uh, actually to um, annotate um, our tissue. Uh, and it worked very well. So at the first level of annotation, we actually could um, um, detect um, all the cell populations that we were expecting and um, transferring or allocating them in space uh, gives us this very beautiful representation of the tonsil structure um, and all these um, clusters have a unique uh, signature. Um, and we can plot actually the cell clusters as humans, what, what we would normally do for single cell uh, RNA-seq data, but uh, with in situ type, you can also plot those uh, in this, uh, all, uh, similar to the uh, embeddings uh, in which we actually show uh, transcriptional similarity and uh, assignment likelihoods. But it's beautiful to see that we have all the epithelial cells in one, in one side uh, in the, in the top left corner that we have all the germinal center B cells in the other side, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course we want to do something else than just cell typing in space, right? We want to study how cells interact in the tissue um, with each other. Uh, and for that, we perform receptor ligand analysis, a cell, cell communication tool. We, you, you, uh, we use common, COMOT for that, which is an optimal transport-based uh, tool that actually um, uh, considers um, uh, physical distances between cells. And um, what, what you can see is now different, let's say in each of these uh, plots, you see a different cell population that we have already detected in the, in the tissue. And in each row, you see a receptor ligand pair. And in each plot, you have two columns. The first column is for uh, the ligand. The second com column is for the receptor. And we have yellow, it's highly expressed, right? And just two examples. Um, so we have reticular fibroblasts, a particular stromal population that um, uh, secretes two different ligands and that we see that interact with both of these ligands um, with uh, T cells using two different receptors. So that's what we, we would get for, from single cell data. But now what we can get apart from it is that this communication between the same two types of, cell, of cells, it actually occurs in different uh, places in the tonsil, depending on the molecules that they are using uh, to communicate. Um, and 
We can also perform some more, let's say, histology-based uh, analysis, and we can zoom into the epithelial region of the tonsil. So the epithelial is always very structured, and you have a basal site and an apical or luminal site. And um, we have actually different epithelial cell populations forming a gradient within or along this axis, right? And we can see how the different keratins, which are the molecules that characterize these cell types, are actually um, 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 expressed uniquely or combined differently in each of these um, epithelial populations. And uh, on the right, on the very left, you can see how the different keratins are actually also uh, localized specifically either in the basal site or in the luminal site. And if you now, uh, let's say, measure the distance uh, along this axis from uh, the basal to the luminal site, we can also now quantify or measure um, the localization of different immune populations within uh, this epithelial layer and along this axis, which might be informative uh, then to also understand how the different immune populations communicate with the different epithelial cells. We can also have a closer look at other uh, uh, very well-defined structures in the tonsil, such as the germinal centers, um, which uh, you can see here, this, uh, let's say, uh, bubbles, right, composed mainly, mainly of B cells. Uh, and how the different um, identified B cells localize also differently uh, within these germinal centers. We have a very well-defined light zone, a dark zone. We have a mantle zone, which is this yellow uh, uh, sort of uh, moon shape in one side of the germinal centers. And But going beyond of uh, this, again, this positioning uh, of uh, annotating cells in, in these regions, we can also perform some, um, let's say, cell-free type of analysis. Um, and for example, look at gradients of expression, uh, taking together all of the germinal centers and plotting an axis from the mantle zone, this yellow area towards the other side and see how gene expression changes along, along this axis. And you can see how there's a continuum of gene expression um, along this axis, which correlates or anti-correlates with this axis, depending on the type of functions that those uh, molecules are having uh, and also correlating nicely with the different proportions of cells that you have in the different regions. And um, this type of, of data actually, which is very visual, right? Also allow us to, uh, let's say, try to understand some potential artifacts that you detect uh, in, in single cell data. So one of the things that we saw um, when cell typing these different clusters that we had is that we had this, uh, TBM population, this germinal center B cells TBM population, which were a mix, let's say, in between uh, macrophages with a very strong macrophage signature, but also a sort of uh, um, low signature on the germinal center B cell uh, um, uh, sort of type of population. And when we looked at those particular cells at this cluster, in the tissue, what we saw is that they were all forming sort of ring-like structures around these black holes that you see uh, in, this, in this image. Uh, but when we plotted then the single molecule information on top of this, uh, on the, uh, of this image, we saw that actually um, we had macrophage-related transcripts very nicely accumulating uh, uh, in these uh, sort of holes and around these areas, while the B cell related transcripts were found overall randomly distributed uh, along the tissue. So, this was actually a clear hint that uh, this population that we could not really properly annotate just based on the transcriptional signature were uh, actually these tangible body macrophages, which have been known um, um, from 
for a long time right now, but uh, based always in imaging, right? So here's, for example, um, uh, these images showing how these macrophages, which are very big phagocytic cells, um, are found within the germinal centers and have these protrusions, these uh, then dendrites, in which they engulf the uh, dying B cells within the germinal center. And that's actually what we were also um, detecting. So those are just bits and pieces, examples of uh, what can we do with um, um, uh, spatially resolved transcriptomics data and how we have used um, um, a very well-defined uh, tissue and very well-known uh, well tissue to actually build uh, a pipeline that will allow us to then um, analyze also less structured, less known, less characterized uh, uh, tissues as the one that I'm um, about to present. So um, that's actually the, the, the goal or one of the main goals that, that, that we have, right? Uh, to, to try to better understand and to better characterize tissues that are not that well characterized. And um, uh, for that, we teamed up with um, the group of Sabine Teshpa in Leuven. Um, they are like experts um, on colorectal cancer and on uh, polyps. And that's actually the data that I will show you um, this uh, second part of the presentation. Um, and we also decided to try to push it a bit farther. And um, we had the chance to get into an early access with Nanostring. Um, the company um, commercializing and, and really developing um, um, Cosmics. And um, they allowed us to send some samples in there and they got uh, the whole transcriptomics. So we are now moving from a 1K panel to the whole transcriptome, reading whole transcriptome in a microscope. Um, and that's uh, what we are now doing. And the whole idea is to try to be um, uh, or try to describe a bit better how these uh, pre-malignant epithelial lesions, which are like polyps, a lot of uh, people, a lot of us have polyps as well, um, that they not necessarily need to transform into uh, cancer, but some of them do. And actually what's uh, um, weird about uh, these tubular bullous adenomas is that they can uh, progress to both mucinous and adenomatous cancerization. Um, and it's not well understood how or why. So we first send two different uh, tissue sections from two different patients that um, we had very well characterized in terms of histopathology already. So um, we have some several areas which only contain he healthy epithelia and several areas that are already transformed. And on the second patient, we even have two different of these uh, two types of, uh, of, of tumors emerging from, um, from the same tissue. So our idea was to actually study uh, this transition from healthy tissue to um, TVA and from TVA uh, to cancer. And um, again, to really um, uh, use all the power that we had to understand better this, this disease, um, we not only um, did this whole transcriptomics, cosmics uh, analysis, but we also paired that from the same tissues, uh, adjacent sections, we also paired that with uh, single nuc RNA sequencing um, to actually also be able to compare how was, uh, um, uh, let's say, the data with one or the other. And as you can see here in these plots, in terms of total counts and in, in terms of uh, unique targets per cell, we have, and we have actually very comparable uh, results. And um, that means that what we get from the uh, um, uh, microscope is actually high quality um, uh, transcriptional data. And now we can also leverage this reference uh, single cell data set that we have to actually um, um, better cluster and annotate the cells in the cosmic tissue. And that's actually what you are looking now at in the uh, left part of the, uh, of the slide. 
And you can see that the different colors actually correspond to different cell types. And we have an idea of the heterogeneity uh, of this, of this uh, tissue section of this tissue. And also leveraging the fact that we have these uh, um, pathology aware um, tools, we can also quantify the different proportions of uh, different cell types within these uh, distinct normal or TBA or tumor regions. And you see that they are actually very, very, very different. Um, we can do that also for the other um, um, sample that we have. And just to mention, we have seven more samples now uh, being acquired. That's uh, an ongoing project, but I thought it was uh, uh, interesting to show. Um, and from, the, from this, we can now also leverage the reference data set um, to actually be able to uh, annotate uh, the single cells. But now we are only looking at the epithelial compartment from this sample um, and allocate these different cell types in space. That's what gives us this very uh, nice uh, compositional image of, of, uh, of this tissue. Each of these clusters has a very unique transcriptional signature. Um, and we can, again, quantify uh, or measure the proportion of these different um, epithelial subtypes in the different regions. Normal uh, is very different and only contains epithelial cell types known to be found in the uh, crypts, um, while in the TBAs, especially in TBA 2, 5, and 4, we have mainly uh, um, this transitional population um, that then changes completely when you go to the TBA3 region in which we mainly have uh, stem-like epithelial cells. So this tells us a lot already of, uh, of how uh, the uh, tissue architect uh, architecture and transcriptional signatures at the single cell level also are paired and linked and how this also, let's say, is linked to what um, uh, can be seen in histo in a histopathology uh, uh, image. Um, now we can also take a zoom in of one of these regions in which we actually have or could have a true transition from a, a normal part of the tissue to a um, transformed TBA area of the tissue. And just by visually looking at these scripts, um, you can see that on a normal part, you have a single layer epithelial uh, uh, while in the transformed area, you have a very dense, um, uh, you have very dense uh, creeps, which are multi-layered, right? And this grid could also be quantified. But what's also interesting is that when you plot in space the different uh, cell clusters in the epithelial compartment, you also see how they are very distinct. Uh, so transcriptionally, cellularly, the composition of the normal versus the TVA um, um, is uh, very distinct. And now, since we have this uh, sort of switch in this midline, uh, we can also measure uh, the different cell types in these cell types from this midline towards the other end of both the TBA region and the normal region um, and have a look at the gradients of cell types along, uh, along, along these, these axes. Um, and if we now would zoom only into a uh, part of the healthy uh, column, that's, it, that's a very nice longitudinal cut, let's say, um, of the colon crypts um, that recapitulate um, uh, what's very well known about epithelial cell differentiation. So we have stem cells in green in the very basal part of the, uh, of the, of the axis, which then uh, differentiated in traditional amplifying cells, and those can give rise to um, the uh, secretory compartment of the goblet cells or towards the apical side to the uh, enterocyte, so the absorptive uh, lineage, uh, being the most differentiated of them all, the best for positive enterocytes. You can see that very nicely here. So that was a very good, also very nice case study for us to see if we could also, in space, uh, so, sort of um, perform trajectory analysis. For that, we use a, sling, a slingshot, which indeed represents exactly uh, what's known from epithelial cell differentiation, but we are, now we can do that in space. Um, and moving one step 
uh, farther, we can represent this um, um, continuum of uh, transcriptional differentiation or trajectory at the tissue-wide level to try to understand not only how the normal epithelial cell differentiation occurs, but also how from the normal, we then get these polyps formed and from these polyps, eventually the cancerizations. Um, so we can really look at the epithelial composition through the pseudotime. Um, and again, this gives us um, a, sort of a similar picture um, that I've uh, presented before in which some of the TBA regions seem to be on this transition, uh, transitionary phase in between the normal and uh, uh, far off, um, let's say, TBA cell types that only uh, um, occur then in very particular regions. And we can also inspect how the niches of these different epithelial cell types or different epithelial cell uh, states also change along the uh, pseudotype. Um, so a bit uh, as a recap, um, um, we believe we have built already a quite efficient analysis pipeline that we can now apply across different um, um, tissues and projects. Um, we have quite nice resolution in terms of uh, uh, granularity of the cell types that we can recover from tissues, even using uh, the 1K uh, panel. Um, Retaining the spatial information really uh, allows us to uh, understand better how cells communicate within tissues. Um, having this um, pathology or histology aware uh, view on tissues uh, also helps us to interpret the data that we get. And um, the, the importance also of this of these uh, continuous um, uh, transcriptional changes that we observe as uh, gradients um, that probably um, uh, also are behind uh, some of the tissue transformations that we are trying to understand and that we can actually run uh, uh, trajectory analysis, uh, let's say leveraging both the time and the space I mentioned on the transcriptional data. And very shortly, uh, as uh, let's say challenges and future uh, future views on spatial transcriptomics. I mean, probably that's the the, the less uh, let's say uh, cool part of it, but it's very important, right? If we really want to um, use these techniques, which are quite expensive uh, and very 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 time consuming, we actually need to extract most of the data that we can get out of them. And we also need to uh, for these data to be reusable. So we definitely have to think a lot on how do we uh, store this data? How do we share this data? How to make it, uh, make it accessible? And for that, we need, uh, let's say, infrastructure and a good data management plan. And also um, um, this, uh, let's say, view on how much do we need to collaborate really in between different um, 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 uh, expertises. Um, because apart from having this high plex uh, data, you have this additional um, um, uh, layer of information, which just adds complexity on it, which is the tissue level, the spatial information, um, and only let's say, communicating uh, very well in between clinicians, pathologists, computational biologists, um, and, and um, the wet lab side, we can really uh, get out the, get the, the best out of, of, of the data generated. And um, the multi-omics is the way to go. Um, and with that, um, I think I'll finish here. I'll thank you again for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. So, what do you use for the spatial data and how do you affect the spatial data? 
Use this file based on single time C reference. And which structures of the team do you, do you choose? And is this? Yeah, very good question, both of them. So, related to the first one, uh, data super sparse. And actually, that's also one of the reasons why um, what I've used, I mean, we have done it also fully unsupervised. But that's one of the reasons why, why we've used in both uh, examples that I've given you this reference data set um, to inform cell clustering and annotation uh, because we do have a lot of uh, zeros, <laughs> a lot. But still, um, you can you can fully characterize the tissue or at least you can characterize the tissue like good enough um, as, as I uh, hope I showed you. And the second one was, yeah, how do we choose the panel, right? So it depends on the technique that we talk about. For the cosmics, we don't choose the panel. That there's only this 1K commercially available panel, which is thought to be a sort of pan organ human characterization panel, if you want to call it that way. Um, it works best in some tissues than in some others, obviously. For example, for the tonsil, it's a beauty. Um, for some cancers, which are very homogeneous, for example, we've done something in uh, chronic lymphocyte leukemia where you only have B cells all over the place and they're all the same, then it's much more uh, challenging. There are some other techniques though like Senium, in which you can really, they have a lot of different options, modules, let's say, of different sets of genes or transcripts that you can detect. Plus, they give you a bit more this flexibility on, okay, build your own panel. And that's, let's say, economically doable. But let me just mention one thing more. So the, I think that the uh, it depends a lot on the question you want to answer, but if you really want to, let's say, explore a tissue or a disease, then, and now the techniques are actually going into that direction and we are able to do that, then you would go to the, directly to the whole transcriptome. And we are quite confident that in there, you actually de detect really almost everything you would detect in a single cell ASIC experiment. Okay. So my question is more on the semi-supervised right? So thing is that you say as you use the frame, right? And mm -hmm. um, See. actually uh, I know it's so in my papers for example we have different modalities and we use for them after so the presentation, but I assume that the research is only the single cell. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Only the only only the single cell. So expression. So the thing is that then. So how? So what is what is the benefit or the information between the research in the single molecule image techniques that you have, or because there you only have like five. So then the addition. You know, you know, like super confident that you can make like super quick annotation, or would be this better or doing the typical decomposition of the I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't have to de to convolute this data because. Uh, I mean, how these two things will be like having in vitro, you have a cell for a spot or something like that, and then just work, but you have all the rest. Yes. Just somehow. Have yeah. I think it's a bit related. The two questions are a bit related. So it's it's obvious that we have this uh, limited plex, right? We only detect these 1,000 um, uh, transcripts. But I have to say that actually to be able to label this, I don't know, I don't know how many clusters we have in there, 14, 15, 20, I don't know, 
actually, you could annotate these different clusters with way less <laughs> than one than one thousand, right? So that's that's one one thing. And the other thing, maybe it will help um, a bit understand how this algorithm works. When we run it semi-supervised with this um, reference, um, not all the clusters that we will get will be directly labeled transfer, let's say. So there will be, we will get some clusters that will be uh, annotated as Ramon's annotations, plus A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And that's actually those clusters that you see with uh, an asterisk, exactly. Uh, those were unassigned clusters that we then manually annotated based on the differential expressed genes. So, I mean, it's very difficult to say, to answer this question. I think, I think the question should be yes, but I'm, I'm not confident to say yes yet. Also, because we haven't compared it in the same tissue. For example, the yeah. tons, the tonsil, it's, it's so well known, so well studied. Every single cell type that you have in there, you know what it is. You know how to, how to call it, right? But in this um, TVA world and colorectal cancer world, there's a lot of, a lot known, but there are a lot of different cell states that. Um, So you can, with this methodology, you can get much more resolution than, for example, with, with reviews, right? But with our, like, the methods of using this technology, like, money or, or like, you can... Very good question. I mean, caveats. On the one hand, what, what, what um, she was saying, right, you don't, on the whole transcriptome, you have whole transcriptome data, but uh, on this limited plex panels, you have what you have, and you're obviously biased already just by design, right? So some exploratory analysis will not be possible to be done with these um, targeted panels. The other caveat is, as you were already pointing, money. I mean, these are a bit more expensive than the regular visium, but it all depends on how you count things, right? If you would now count what um, to do this experiment costs in a parcel basis, then it's actually cheap. It's way cheaper than single cell analysis, just because of the number of cells that you obtain. How far are we from? Being able to do this spatial transcriptome over many individuals. So when I mean many, I mean like, you know, two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably, probably, first, I think we need to really, I mean, the field needs to work and agree on some standards. That's the first thing to do, because if, if we all don't agree on how can we deal with this data, we will not be able to agree on what can we interpret from this data, right? That's one thing. The other thing is probably also money. And the other thing is actually we could already try to, you know, like really, because from each slide, I mean, you can actually, the scan, the scanning area is quite big. So the scanning area for this, uh, at least for cosmics is 20 times 15, millimeters. So we are talking 1.5 times 2 centimeters. It's quite a lot. If you work with very small, with biopsies, you can actually put 12 biopsies or more in there. So you can, in every run, you can actually run four slides in parallel. So you can actually analyze a lot of um, patients in one single experiment, a lot of them. But now, I'm just worried. I mean, and there's a lot of, there's there's some quite a lot of work on that direction, you know, using TMAs, et cetera, et cetera, just maximizing the amount of uh, samples that we can profile at once, which is obvious. You want to reduce also technical variability. But if you look at this tissue or at, you know, at any of these uh, um, two samples, not the IF because we only have four colors, but like the other one. And you see how the, the differences transcriptionally and 
in terms of cellular composition, if we go and profile a very small piece of every tissue, we actually lose yes. the whole dynamics, which probably it's what's marking the disease itself and the pathology. So I think we first need to, you know, be a bit more explorative and, and figure out exactly how disease pathology is actually orchestrated in tissues. And that means big chunks of tissue, of tissue. And, and, and when we understand a bit more, we can then probably um, be more informed on how to really then go to the point where we need to be and profile 1,000 million patients. Oh, probably. I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. Normally, there aren't. And... Are you here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this is probably people complaining about the... Ah, yeah. Sorry, we had... Yes, yes. Okay. If not, we can... Thank you.